Um, Mimi Ito is a cultural anthropologist and learning scientist investigating children and youth's changing relationship to media and communications. And you can see her impressive bio and all the bios of our speakers up on our website at posi.org. Antigone Davis is the director and global head of safety at Facebook. In that role, she works with internal teams, external safety organizations such as FOSI, and government bodies to ensure that Facebook is a world leader in online safety. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Antigone. Thank you. So I told Mimi before we got started, I was so excited because today I get to ask questions instead of <laughs> answering questions. So um, hopefully I'll, I'll do a good job, but you can ask a couple yeah, questions I if you want to. I also ask for permission to ask questions. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just go like straight to the question that I get in almost every interview that comes my way when, it's a, when the interview is about parents, families, and online safety. Um, how much time is too much time? <laughs> That is the question I get to. And I think in a lot of ways, we're kind of trying to correct for some of the messages that were prevalent in our ecosystem that really stress time-based rules for screen time, which I think made sense in an era when it was primarily television, but are making much less sense now that we're in an environment where there's multiple screens and young people are doing homework and socializing and a lot of things that are actually critical to their healthy development and learning through the use of screen-based media. Uh, so there's the combination of the um, screen time as a concept being around for so long uh, and I think uh, bias in the media coverage around screen time uh, related issues that has tended to uh, cover, or at least what gets circulated most, is a lot of the negative stuff. And that's been talked about here. And I've been really heartened by the fact that the conversations that I've been hearing throughout the day, and like the video you just saw, have really focused on, you know, uh, both a more complex narrative, but also a positive narrative. And um, I see Alicia Bloom Ross there, who together with Sonia Living has done some really good work in suggesting that it's not about quantity, it's about quality. And, uh, you know, we've been part of a research network um, around this idea of connected learning, which uh, one part of that is connected parenting too, right? We believe that humans are social beings by nature. And now that so much of our technology centers around social connection, you know something about that. Uh, it's really important to understand that you're not just disconnecting kids from uh, entertainment content, but you're actually disconnecting them from social relationships uh, when you're limiting screen use. So that's sort of a fundamental shift in our ecosystem. So when we talk about connected parenting, not only do we stress that parents need to think about quality and not just quantity, but parents really need to uh, take an active listening role in terms of what young people are doing to connect and share, uh, to share your own interests, to take an active uh, interest in your kids' uh, online engagements. And only after establishing a basis of trust and connection can you effectively guide and become a media mentor. So that's um, some of the fundamentals. And it's very, you know, I think that the, the challenge is that not only have we not necessarily grown up with the games and technologies that our kids are growing up with? Um, they're often uh, opaque to us, uh, and we don't necessarily you know, have the time or the ability to learn all of this new stuff. So it does require a new set of alliances, I think, to guide parents into what actually quality engagement looks like. Well, that's actually sort of takes me to, to maybe the next question. Because first of all, that answer, when I, I may, fundamentally correlates to what we see on our platform and, and the kind of sophisticated engagement that we see um, starting at, you know, from when people join the platform through their, through their teen years. But what I think for parents, when, when you're used to or want that simple answer, you know, eat this many fruits a day, um, because you're juggling a lot of different, different things, having complex information to think through in that way can be very hard um, as a parent. And one of the things I'd love to hear from you is how do you think we can actually, or can parents, 
um, potentially make use of communities or social communities, or how can we create things online to help parents um, in some way? Or have you thought about that? Yeah, I mean, when we talk to parents, I think there's this overwhelmedness about it right now because there isn't clarity about what the trust, trusted brands and communities are in the online space, and we're still fairly early in establishing them. So you have some great um, companies and organizations represented here, like Sesame Workshop or Lego, uh, you know, Roblox. Uh, you know, there's organizations like Common Sense Media or FOSI who have been filling in that gap and trying to. Uh, develop brands that are clearly uh, brands, guidelines, standards that are about family friendliness. Uh, but quite frankly, this is one of the complaints I have about COPA, and I saw it in the FOSC statement as well, is that partially because of a lot of the ways in which COPA, the unintended consequences of COPA, it's actually really, really hard to create organizations and companies that serve children in the internet. Um, both because the commercial incentives are by nature lower than if you're designing an adult product, but also the compliance issues if you're a commercial um, entity. But even, like I run a nonprofit in this space and it's actually really, really challenging. Uh, you know, so I don't think there's enough of them, quite frankly. And so you get even into the space, like we do a lot of work in gaming, um, Minecraft, Roblox, which I think are really incredible spaces for uh, not just as tools, but as community spaces. I think the, you know, whether it's Minecraft.edu or uh, efforts that Roblox have been doing on community moderation, you know, there are uh, trust, you know, certain a certain amount of trust that's been established, but there's still a lot of fear and uncertainty about parental use of those platforms. And I think, um, you know, I'm curious if you see a space of opportunity in something like Facebook groups, but uh, I think it's, if you take an analogy from the good old days, uh, you know, you, you have athletic teams and clubs, for example, right? So you kind of, as a parent, you don't have to do a ton of research about your local little league or tennis club to feel that your kid is probably okay and the coach is there, you know, their families, they're part of your community. There's a community that you can trust and you don't do a lot of digging into the fine print about whether what are their privacy policies? You know, are they taking safety seriously? It's kind of a community contract. And does the equivalent exist for gaming for most families? Probably not. So um, I've been part of one effort, uh, the, Nas uh, the National, um, the North American Scholastic Esports Federation, which is an example of a new and emerging organization that's trying to create a network of high school-based esports clubs. My nonprofit, Connected Camps, we provide the coaching, so we train teenagers who are gamers to coach younger kids. Um, but that's an example, it's a very early effort, but it's an example of a gap in the ecosystem, right? Of a trusted organization that's gonna say, look, if your kid is playing for a NACEF league, you know you have a coach who's gone through the safe sport training, who's been background checked, who's been um, instructed in how to work well with young people. And unfortunately, you know, this is a labor of love that's um, funded by a philanthropist who cares about it, but what are the incentives in the ecosystem for more organizations like that? It's actually interesting that you brought up Facebook groups, because we do see um, people use Facebook groups in a lot of different ways, and parents actually using Facebook groups to connect around a variety of different issues where they may provide guidance or um, information that could be useful. I, I do think there may be an opportunity to think about how you could formalize something like that in the space, uh, you know, on in Facebook or even more broad, more broadly. Um, so I'll take that away as an as an action <laughs> an action item. But I, I think there there are real opportunities to sort, especially because we know that parents do turn to other parents. Um, what I thought was interesting about the analogy that you that you brought up is that if you think about sort of a sport, sports organization and, and having that accreditation, what comes around that, that if you look in the offline world for those organizations, are there are certain obligations that come with that. We are gonna do background checks, we're gonna do, we do the, these things, this is how we, create a safe space for your child. And it really does make me think about what we have, you know, who are all the different um, players in this space? We've, there was some 
teasing about legislation, but what does that legislation or what are those obligations and what should they be? And I, you know, I think from Facebook's perspective, we've clearly come to um, a place where we feel that it is important to find that right, those right sets of regulation that will actually be useful to companies like ourselves. Um, but it also does mean building in those um, they're not so much regulatory bodies, but there are those soft intermediaries that play that role of providing that kind of sense of security that parents look for in all different types of organizations. I think it's a, a, a great uh, concept. One of the things that I know that you work on a lot is connected um, learning. I'd love to, and I think some of the challenging conversations of the day, um, put, you know, create some sort of threat for that kind of connected learning. I, I would love to hear from you how you're thinking about making sure people really are aware of the opportunities that that threat doesn't encroach on that, uh, the possibilities there. Yeah, so uh, my primary research is actually, I'm a cultural anthropologist and I hang out with kids on the internet um, when they're doing the things that are re they're really passionate about, like music fandoms and gaming and, um, you know, it's a kind of learning that is motivated by young people's interests and usually supported by peers and caring adults who share that interest, but often on the um, outskirts or outside of the school-based system. And what the internet has really offered, especially for kids with interests that may not be well represented within a local community or they might have a stigmatized identity, uh, that it's really a lifeline to finding a community of um, kids who care about the same things and uh, a peer learning community where they are empowered to uh, find you know, people who they share interests with as well as information. And I I'm sure many of you saw the recent Common Sense Media Census and sort of the eye-popping um, statistics around YouTube access. And when you talk to young people, sure, it's about entertainment, it's about influencers and things like that, but a lot of it is about learning uh, and curiosity and things like that. And my big fear, while of course, like everybody in the room, I, we care so much about the safety of kids and when that gets violated, the violations are so horrific. But I think it's really important uh, to realize that, you know, millions and millions of kids every day are getting huge benefits from platforms like YouTube. Uh, where they are connecting to knowledge and information that they wouldn't have otherwise have access to. And that is sort of the bigger picture that I think uh, can sometimes get lost in our effort to protect kids. And an important part of that picture is that intergenerational connection is actually necessary for learning. And that's the connected part, right? It's like, okay, kids are amazing, and kids hang out with kids, they can do amazing things. But what really makes a community powerful, whether it's like a Minecraft community that builds binary calculators through Redstone, or whether it's uh, fan fiction writers on the internet writing hundreds of pages about One Direction, or whatever it is, the amazing things that kids are doing online um, are possible because they're mixed age communities. Because there are eight year olds hanging out with 16 year olds who have heroes who are 21 year olds. And that is the magic of how learning works when you're doing things with people who share your identity, passion, who are driving you to do better. It's not just about protecting them, but it's about um, giving them a protective community, right? And so a lot of times we talk about um, safety and sort of youth voice and empowerment and risks as if they're like a tension or a balance, but actually when kids are in communities where there are mixed age groups of people looking out for each other, just like in real life communities, that is actually protective. That is what is going to create safety. And for every ounce of attention, on content moderation, I feel like the industry, all of us need to spend as much attention on community organizing and community management as we do on content moderation. Because of course you wanna get rid of all the nasty adversarial stuff, but what you really wanna do is train communities to support kids and to make sure that YouTube isn't excluding everybody under 16, but is actually 
and incentivizing people to make those comments be less toxic, to be posting content that, you know, kids of all ages will love and appreciate. And I think that's the part that um, I wish there was more research and attention uh, as we sort of move further along this pathway to understanding what makes the internet better for kids. So um, action item number two is how to develop uh, resiliency and, and safeguards for kids through the community that yeah. they're engaging in. Um, I think we're out of time. So that feels like it was very short. I yeah. wish I could continue the conversation with you by myself. Um, thank you very, very much. Uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you and people get a chance to talk to you afterward. Great, thank you.